please come to the website, check out uh, other shows, other sessions, other offerings, and don't skip by the donate button on the screen. Help us continue the difficult conversations to make good trouble, the thought-provoking discussions that hopefully will help build dialogue in a very polarized, divided time. And we're extremely fortunate to have with us today, speaking of divided and polarized times, one of the best of the best at bringing together divided and polarized people and groups and finding ways to engineer convergence. And the organization that Rob founded and is still a senior director for is called the Convergence Policy Center. Rob Fersh, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to see you again, Chuck. Thanks for having me. So how long has your life work been, Convergence? Not just the organization, but that work. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question, actually, because I have friends who called me the Henry Clay of my elementary school playground. Henry Clay, Clay was a congressman from Kentucky who was known as the great compromiser. And so I guess I was always kind of a mediator at heart. But in truth, career-wise, um, after college and law school, I came to Washington and became an advocate and spent the first half of my career uh, dealing with issues of hunger and poverty in the United States. And so while I was always someone who was sort of a mediator at heart and very good at developing relationships across differences, I had a very much a well-formed opinion and I think was an effective advocate for the policies I fought for when I worked for three congressional committees, all related to hunger and poverty or income security in this country. And then I ran a progressive national anti-hunger organization for 12 years. Um, but Increasingly, as I spent time there, I ran into so many people with such decency who wanted to solve problems like I did, but disagree with me totally. And it struck me that it was a shame that we had no place to sit down and talk through our collective ideas about what could make things better. And and to, and you know, it began to blow up in my face that you know one side or one ideology or one political party had all the answers. And so, I eventually. Um, decided that a, a larger calling for me beyond the advocacy was to bring people together to work for common purpose. And I'm pleased to say at least three people who I debated when I was an anti-hunger advocate have served on the Convergence Board. I met them and they were from different political views and perspectives, but we hit it off and they too wanted to have more civil ways to discuss tough issues and find answers. And they became partners, as did many other people. And trying to set up convergence, which was an attempt to create a space in Washington. Uh, at first, for only national issues, now we're working at all different levels to bring together people whose divisions stood in the way of progress. So I've been basically doing this work professionally for now 26, 27 years. Uh, and for about 23, 24 years before that, I was more of an advocate. And so, has it been your experience, as I'm sensing from what you say? that even fairly deeply and strongly divided and polarized people and groups can engage in collaborative communications and can conceive of collaborative outcomes, solutions? Yeah, that has been my experience. It doesn't mean everybody can, Chuck. I mean, there are people who are too blinded by ideology or have feelings that about people of different races or ethnicities or religions and and while occasionally you can create breakthroughs there's some people with whom you can't communicate well and break down those barriers but our experience at convergence and mine even before that working for a group called search for common ground was we would bring together people who didn't even think they could talk to each other no less work together so long as they had a shared purpose that that was an essential organizing tool. We couldn't just get people to the table to say, now you two need to get along better, or you four, or you 25. But we'd say, you know, like I organized a project back in 2003 on healthcare coverage. This is even before convergence. And there, everyone agreed that Americans ought to have healthcare coverage. The disagreement was how to provide it. Was it private sector exclusively? Was it government? What mix of government and private sector? And for years, the country had been gridlocked on how to do that. 
And, you know, we brought together the same people who had been at total war during the Clinton administration. You may recall Hillary Clinton led an effort right. to create a national health care plan. And there were national commercials and people attacking each other. And it was really quite ugly and it went nowhere. And um, just, you know, maybe seven, eight years later, uh, I work with leaders in the healthcare uh, field all across from consumers to physicians, to pharmaceutical companies, to hospitals, to insurers. Um, and we assembled a table, uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, labor unions, and so on, to figure out, well, is there something we could do together uh, uh, to meet the goal which the group established, which was to provide health care coverage to as many people as quickly as possible? And that, so that was a unifying theme. And then eventually we developed some basic principles and began to work out the architecture of how we could cover a lot more people, starting with children. What to you are the key elements, the key steps in getting people to the table, motivating them to come? Well, there's a lot of, a lot of different ways to get people to the table. In the case of healthcare, at that time, I think people were just frustrated because all their own advocacy was leading nowhere. And as one major participant, a guy helped me organize it, Ron Pollack, who was at Families USA then, said, for decades, everybody wants to cover the uninsured. And their first choice is their own solution, and their second choice is the status quo. So in that case, partly it was just frustration. Um, and then Ron Pollack helped organize that project, reached out to insurance companies, and some of them said, this will get Ron Pollack off our backs. Maybe we'll come to the table. So some people come for defensive reasons. So in, uh, in other cases, um, it's just... Sometimes uh, I ran a project, uh, co-directed co a project on U.S. Muslim relations years ago. And early on, we got some very um, influential people like Madeleine Albright and former Ambassador Dennis Ross and former Congressman Vin Weber. And they thought it was a really good idea to have a conversation about what should we do about U.S. relations with the Muslim world. This was at the height of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, you know, once Madeleine Albright said she thought it was a good idea, then people wanted to be at that table. In other instances, like on in our education project, we had a woman who was a fierce advocate for school choice, a critic of teachers' unions, and we invited her in. She said, you know, she told us when we interviewed her for, for our book, um, From Conflict to Convergence, she said, I had no optimism that this gab fest you're pulling together was going to work anywhere, but if the teachers' unions are going to be at the table... Uh, people who are going to be opposed to my ideas about school reform and educational reform, I better be there to protect my own interests and at least neutralize them. And of course, the end result was that they came up with a transformative vision. And now we spun off an entire nonprofit working to create um, something called learner-centered education around the country. And then she even went on a speaking engagement with a woman who's now the president of the National Education Association, the largest teachers union, largest union in the country. So the way to get people in is either they're frustrated or they get intrigued or they feel like they can't miss it for some reason. Um, and, they're, and they're willing to take a chance. And somehow it's just building trust with us as conveners that we're neutral, that our goal is to get as many people's needs met as possible. We don't put a finger on the scale. And we end up framing the issue in a way that feels inviting to them. It feels like, yeah, I do want to discuss that issue it's not being resolved. Current efforts are either gridlocked or not going anywhere. In the case, case of our education work, it was really quite a creative out-of-the-box solution. Uh, in some cases, we do more split the difference, but most of the time we're looking for really win-win solutions. And I think once people get in the room, they do stay. Most people have a wonderful experience, but your question is right. Getting people in the room itself is very difficult and often a huge accomplishment, but one we think is really important just to get people talking and talking constructively. You know, and, and we're hearing several things that the framing in a way that's sufficiently objective and attractive to people, non-off-putting to the people that you need to get to the table is critical. But it sounds like also the people are. If they hear that the people who are the advocates that they need to achieve balance with or not lose influence with are at the table, they need to be there to protect their interests. If the people are there that they're going to need to try and convince to move more in their direction or come to some 
sorts of compromise are there, then that's another need that may be met by showing up. <laughs> and the other is, as you've said, the issue itself, if it's framed in a way that makes them feel like, you know what, if they're really going to get people who have influence in this area to the table, I want to be there. I want to have a voice. Mm -hmm. So well, the people, the voice, the issue, yeah. that's quite a, quite a kitchen full of ingredients and recipes to put together. Yeah. And uh, there's no one recipe that necessarily works for every process. Some of it's just who you get to begin with. But more often than not, I think, Chuck, what you're getting to is underneath it all, people actually share values. You know, people believe in the American dream. They may disagree how much the government should do and how much should be just more private effort. And, you know, what can we do to help people? People believe that um, people get out of prison ought to not be back in prison and not not spending on social welfare. And sometimes the, there are differences of opinion about related issues, about how tough on crime, how long sentencing should be, should there be mandatory minimums, may get in the way of larger uh, goals they might share. And in the case of our project on incarceration, which is very much uh, covered in our book, there were people who um, you know, really came from very opposite ends of the political spectrum but they actually saw they wanted the same things uh, for people. They often disagreed on how to get there. And in that case, again, there was some unexplored territory that no one had really fully addressed. Like, what do you do in prison to get people better, um, to uh, more prepared to leave? How do you create connections to the local communities they're returning to? And how do we have sort of a seamless system that no matter when people are getting out, they've got, they're healthy enough that they can survive, they've got community where they go back to, they've got job prospects, and they've got mentors and friends who maybe help them stay out of the criminal justice system. So there was a shared goal there and everyone's interest was being served, but nobody had really quite convened all the people from across the spectrum to discuss what was the most effective means to do so that we could all get behind. It's a really valuable understanding, I think for all of us, and well beyond any particular community or country or globally, that if we can reach a mutually agreed understanding of what the issue, the problem to be addressed is, <clears throat> reaching that understanding itself may open just enough cracks in the doors for people to start to see the role and value of each one's place in what might be a solution path. Yeah. So how do you how do you manage to elicit that in your convergence communications and dialogues? The common purpose and the shift in priorities from individually competitive to mutually beneficially collaborative there's a supposition there uh, that you know that is sometimes true and not always true i mean we have people who generally agree on these you know we do a lot of research we do interviews we try to make sure we understand what people want uh to achieve and whether you've got private interests like private prisons might have an interest some people think they have an interest in keeping people in prison longer to make more money and the guy we had from Core Civic said, no, that's not what we're about. We really want to help people get out of prisons. We want to do a better job than a lot of the public prisons. And by the way, we diversified our business to run reentry programs. So we make a profit if people get out of prison. So I think most of the time, most people are have shared goals about what ought to be uh, you know, operational in society. Um, and and we convene them around that. In fact, we do our research and we say, would you like to join a conversation that helps people thrive when they get out of prison? Would you like to be in a conversation about how people can achieve the American dream through greater economic mobility? And there's an example, by the way, when we started, that project was called Economic Inequality. And we thought that was pretty neutral, but we learned in a series of interviews that some people more on the conservative side viewed economic inequality as almost a placeholder for economic redistribution. 
So they suggested either economic opportunity or economic mobility. And we said, fine, because the same things would get discussed. There wasn't some overriding finger on the scale from us that everyone had to have equal incomes. Well, we felt like the opportunity agenda allowed us to discuss what kind of supports people needed, um, you know, what kind of pay levels we, they, they might have, what kind of tax credits might be necessary, and so on, the barriers to having people achieve economic independence through work. And that was the focus there. It was really about work. Um, what a lot of people needed supports. We, that group did, could not reach agreement on minimum wage, which was a big discussion. But they basically agreed on a principle. And this is really important, Chuck. One of the things we do early on, beyond having an overall goals, most of our projects will develop a series of principles that will help pe guide people, things they can buy into without necessarily agreeing on how to get them, how to get uh, to achieve those pr principles. So in this case, uh, you know, we had they had a principle akin to the fact that if you work full time, you should be able to not live in poverty. That wasn't the exact wording, but that was a principle. But that opened the debate. OK, interestingly enough, a lot of sort of progressive advocates uh, uh, wanted private businesses to do more and pay higher wages. And what the business people also said, yeah, if people work for full time. They shouldn't be in poverty, but don't. Let's only ask us to raise wages if we're, you know, a, a restaurant struggling or we live in an area where the cost of living is less and and so on. And, and they probably would have been more open to, you know, some government tax credits, the kinds of things to help equalize the 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 playing field. I don't I don't have all their arguments at my fingertips. This, pro this project ran about a decade ago. But that's the kind of interaction you have when you have shared goals and shared principles it begins to narrow. Um, the choices for what you're trying to achieve. And you build trust that at least this other person isn't ill-intentioned. They may not want to raise the minimum wage. It doesn't mean they want people to live in poverty. And that becomes an aha moment. Okay, now we got something we can work on. We may disagree about how, but we really, on the underlying goal, we're in, we're in substantial agreement. It sounds like areas in which you and Convergence have done really dedicated long-term work have had major impacts that it's it's my impression that your work may have been instrumental and foundational in what eventually came to pass as the Affordable Care Act, that your work clearly with economic opportunity has been picked up. In fact, one of the current presidential candidates is basing her campaign on an opportunity economy, which probably bears a very, very direct relation to the learning that's come from the convergence dialogues and communications and sessions that you've engineered. How do you get the ear, the receptivity, the buy-in from the policymakers to take this from the discussions to enactment and implementation? Well so let me be as transparent as I can be that it doesn't always happen. Um, the first project I ever ran, I'd never done this before, was the healthcare coverage project. And I want to be really careful about what I say because some people would say there might not be an Affordable Care Act, but for those efforts, on the other hand, the Affordable Care Act went further than our consensus. Uh, but what it did do is it formed relationships of trust amongst people who used to fight tooth and nail. It as one conservative said to me, you know, he thought the Affordable Care Act went too far. The architecture of the Affordable Care Act was kind of, if not invented, it was certainly um, reinforced by our process. And so there was some impact. In fact, in the short term, there was more impact before the Affordable Care Act on covering children, which was less controversial. And it helped lead to some bipartisan efforts to expand that. On the other projects, some of them are still pending how much impact, some affect people's thinking. I think everyone believes in an opportunity nation. So how one presidential candidate defines it today may be different than another presidential candidate. So it's not like we laid the groundwork for that particular uh, policy, uh, presidential candidate's agenda. Uh, but these ideas are out there. Uh, we recently ran a new project. This is after I had stepped down as CEO on supports for working families, and it was very much uh, liked by people left and right. And you ask the question, well, how do you get it to the policymakers? Well, not all of our projects lead to public policy. Sometimes uh, 
our economic um, our so-called working up project years ago, probably the biggest impact is that Walmart and McDonald's made a whole series of changes in how people can move up the ladder in their own companies and get ready to move out. And there are other ideas still sitting sitting on you know on the sidelines waiting for Congress to act. So there's you know we're a crazy quilt of results and, and education. We now if we spun off this nonprofit that's working from the grassroots up to get people to adopt these ideas and not trying to make it cookie cutter or national policy and so on. But to get the attention of policymakers, you you try to have people at the table who have influence of policymakers, uh, whose views they respect. And when we did our supports of working families, we ended up doing a press conference on Capitol Hill with leading Republican and Democratic senators who believe in these ideas and we're hoping they will take hold. Um, and it's not our job, Convergence, to actually do the lobbying for it. We never take positions, but we'll continue to facilitate the people and hope they will work together toward those ends. We did a project just to make this too long an answer on long-term care, and we came up with an elegant solution of a combination of public and private efforts. And those ideas are still pending and people are still refining them and making them better. That hasn't passed yet, but we certainly hope that those ideas and the connections we built between people who only wanted private solutions, people who only wanted big public solutions have been sustained. And these people continue to talk to each other and work for those for the for the ideas they put forward at the time. I mean, when you think about it in the context of the times that we're now experiencing, it's pretty phenomenal to be able to not only be optimistic about that possibility, but to be experientially faithful that it can work. It does work. So you know, it does work, and you know, it works to varying degrees. And we think there is great reason for optimism that people can work together. And there are times when situations at the national level are such that either Congress is so divided, or perhaps the leader of the executive branch, the president, maybe not someone who wants to talk to other people. And so then we may turn our attention to more issues where there are more private sector solutions or go to the state level to do so. We try to adjust with reality. But our theory of change is if we can get the groups whose divisions are standing in the way of progress in Congress, and Congress says, oh my God, the chamber and the AFL-CIO, for instance, or you know, prison critics and private prisons all have similar ideas. We hope that smooths the path for people to adopt policies that um, are safer to adopt because they know they won't be facing huge attacks from people on the left or right if the ideas really reflect a consensus that meets the needs and concerns of virtually everyone at the table. And while we do believe that compromise is, is not a dirty word, it's very important that these ideas not involve compromising any deep values or principles. Because if they do and people sign off on it, holding their nose, they're gonna come back and fight a few years later. So all the more reason to have a diversity of views, help push thinking to another level and try to get a consensus that's actionable and leaves people excited that they wanna work for it. In the extremely difficult, controversial, polarized areas where convergence has taken on this work, which are the hardest? I know you've done work in gun control, done work in education. Which have been the hardest and why? What about them makes them more intractable? I don't know if I have a good answer on that because we tend to take on issues where people have very strong disagreements. Um, I think some issues are more difficult to begin with if you have people who are deeply ideological, and we do include people like that. But so much has to do with the culture we create in the room, the ground rules by which we operate, the unlikely friendships that develop, and so on. So I don't know if any one is more difficult than the other. It might be one we think is going to be easier, and then it turns out there's some real roadblocks and so on. You know, we did a pro this project we did on working up on um, economic mobility. Um, I can't remember if you and I have discussed this before, but there was a woman who'd spent much of her career as a critic of Walmart. She represented, um, uh, she she worked for an employment law project and a um, very reasonable person believed in dialogue, was happy to participate. And she had vowed, given her study of Walmart, this is now 10, 15 years ago, that she would never travel to Bentonville, Arkansas in her life because that's the headquarters of Walmart. Then we had this wonderful person who was senior in the HR department at Walmart come to the table. 
She had a very interesting background. She worked for foundations. She wasn't an ideologue. She just wanted to help people move up the economic ladder. And she comes to the table and they become fast friends. They begin to share ideas. They begin to realize they want the same things for people. And then our group came up with a series of ideas I've mentioned before that Walmart found actionable. And we brought them into a session at Convergence, which we do like twice a year to bring together all our friends to hear about the work. And they told the story. I mean, uh, Judy Conti told the story that she didn't think she could ever work with Walmart or a woman from Walmart. And then the woman from Walmart said, you know, I didn't think I could work with the advocates until I met Judy. And then they got up and hugged each other in front of the whole crowd. And wouldn't you know it, within weeks or so of that time, Judy from the Employment Law Center traveled to Bentonville and went to a conference that Ellie had organized because they'd built trust with each other and they felt they could work together. It didn't change the world completely. It didn't create huge economic mobility, but it was a proof of concept that within certainly certain quarters, we could really achieve better understandings, better ideas, and begin to get ideas implemented that we hope will grow over time. Again, the legislative agenda, as far as I know, didn't move much, but all sorts of other ideas move forward and relationships change and people understand each other. Now, Ellie, who worked at Walmart at the time, has now joined the Convergence Board of Directors in the last year because she had such a great experience talking to people across differences at our table. Certainly a success story. So let me pose a, a different challenge question. Is there hope for gun control for children and members of the public? Well, I'm not an expert on if there's hope for gun control. What I can say to you is that I do believe the experience we have, we ran a project uh, and we had to choose carefully because we wanted to move into the guns issue, but didn't want to move full force into the hardest and toughest issues to begin with. So we, after research, decided we could do a project on guns and suicide. And that ah, was yeah. sort of a safer angle to come in. And we had gun advocates and we had anti-gun people at the table, people who thought, you know, the levels of guns in the country were outrageously dangerous. But they also, sh all of them shared the pain of knowing that people would die from shooting themselves. And of course, the success rate for people who want to take their own lives uh, through guns is higher than virtually any, any other means. So it's deadly. And we also knew, and this research shows, that many people take their lives in a moment of great distress at a moment where perhaps they'll recover if we, if things can happen on time. And so we convened these people and they came up with a whole series of ideas that I don't recall every one of them, but you know, about how to store guns and gun safety and mental health issues and so on. And there were also those revelations. People had you know, impressions of each other. I, there's one favorite story I have and it's in the book of, there's a woman who teaches psychology at George Washington University. She is black and she's also a, a minister by training. And she'd done a lot of work on the effect of gun violence, I believe on women. I think she was also involved in maybe helping counsel young women of color who'd been affected by violence. So she's a lovely person. And again, someone who believed in dialogue, but in her life, she said she'd never really sat down with a gun rights person. And we had several gun rights people, all of whom are pained by unnecessary death but also strong believers in their view of the Second Amendment. And there was one day where uh, a fellow who was very active on the gun rights side, and um, I don't think, I don't know, I think I've met him. I don't recall him distinctly, but one day, and because we were doing this during the pandemic and it was all on Zoom, they decided to show, you know, uh, take a tour of his gun collection of, which he had on a wall in a room, and there was, I don't know how many, but probably several dozen guns hanging there. And he begins to explain the different guns and how they operate and so on. And the black woman, the professor um, from uh, George Washington, um, she's getting more and more agitated inside to see this sort of stereotypical sort of muscular. Arsenal. <laughs> going as arsenal. And, and finally, after a while, because they'd already built some trust, she said, I'm uncomfortable. You know, if a black man was sitting in front of the arsenal of guns, I'm not sure the reaction, the oohs and ahs from the crowd about your collection would be quite the same. And this gentleman, as I understood it, I wasn't part of this particular discussion. I did attend in some of the meetings, said basically, you know, I, I agree with you. 
I think it would be received differently. And that's really a good point. And then she went on to say, why do you need so many guns? Why do you have so many guns? And his answer shocked her and changed her perceptions. He looked at her and he said, it's fun. I like shooting guns. It's fun. And millions of people enjoy shooting guns. And in his case, it wasn't, I think, to be part of a militia or because he had designs to be violent toward other people. And it dis and that little that answer literally disarmed her. She couldn't see him the same way. Yeah, he's just doing this for fun. He's not doing it to, sh you know, show white power or bravado or or to promote violence. He just enjoyed shooting guns and loved having these sort of toys that he had. At least that's the story to the best of my knowledge. I hope I did it justice, but that's also one in the book as we talked to both of these people before we um, uh, to include them in the book. So we're hearing some, as we get into our last couple of minutes here, we're hearing some not just common grounds on problems and solutions, but common values that bring people to the table because they're worth trying to see if we can do something about them. Suicides are over 50,000. They are the largest source of youth death in the country. Right. Um, and, and it's getting worse. And I don't think anyone, even the most pro Second Amendment people, would disagree that the unnecessary death of a child or a member of the public in gun violence is something that we all would really, really love to prevent and minimize. Yeah, I, I do think, and this is something we talk about all the time, my co-author Mariah Levison and I, we don't want to overstate it, but basically, we don't think people are at odds on values. I mean, there are some values where people are at odds, but they may not, may not necessarily affect policy. I mean, some people may be deeply materialistic. Uh, some people may be deeply greedy, but uh, and so on. But most people share values about, you know, innocent people shouldn't die from gunfire or any other uh, means. Innocent people, uh, you know, all people should have opportunity to make a living. People should be able to have access to affordable health care and decent quality health care. So it's not so much about values, I think, although there are some value differences that get in the way. But I think it's more about how do you get, how do you implement those values? What are the steps? All of us have disagreements about how the world works. And it's through the power of dialogue. You know, Daniel Yankelovich wrote a book 25 years ago or so called The Magic of Dialogue. And I love that book. And I got to know Dan and he was involved with convergence. And he basically said, you know, dialogue allows you to hear each other, allows you to build bonds of community, it allows you to break up stereotypes and misconceptions about each other. And at a minimum, you narrow the differences. You won't necessarily agree on everything. In the education project, the union leader, teachers union leader, was never going to go for school choice. And the woman who wants school choice was always going to want school choice, but they won't. They agreed to disagree about that and came up with this big idea that no matter whether you're a charter school, a public school, a private school, or homeschooling, taking an approach to put the learners at the center rather than the old factory approach that most, most education systems use now where the, all the children of the same age learn the same thing at the same time in the same place. We need to adjust to the fact people have different learning styles, different interests, different aspirations, and without making ourselves crazy, trying to re meet, meet those needs. And that was a huge accomplishment where people began to see, okay, let's make that the centerpiece rather than fighting about whether there's charter schools or not charter schools because they weren't going to resolve that. Let's see if we can infuse the education system with almost a transformative vision about how we get through to kids and help them actualize themselves. And they got very excited about it. So excited that when the project ended in terms of our work, the whole group said, don't leave us, facilitate us. We want to keep talking and move these ideas forward and convergence help for a couple of years. And then because they had already were taking positions, even though they were sort of consensus positions in that group, and we're neutral, we said, okay, go ahead, spin off an organization, get a board together that's passionate only about this issue and go out and make hay. And they did. Rob Fersh, co-author of From Conflict to Convergence, Coming Together to Solve Tough Problems with Mariah Ellison, the co-author. 
Levison. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm sorry, Levison. And thank you so much for joining us, for your insights, for your wisdom, for your optimism, and for your reason for hope. Chuck, it's a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you for the very skillful and helpful interview. And, and hopefully some of these ideas will take hold in the world with your help. Thanks again. Thank you.